Are you beating up the fish in your games, but struggling against the pros? I'm gonna give you a four-step guide on how to crush poker professionals. But first, I wanna start with something that I think gets overlooked a lot. How do you play preflop against pros? In short, we wanna be doing a lot of calling. Why? We want to let fish in the pot. Fish are going to make giant mistakes post-flop, where for the most part, pros are going to generally play pretty well. So we wanna be doing a lot of calling, but we can't just never three bet a pro when they open. So what do we do? We want to play what's called a polarized three bet strategy, where we're going to be three betting our very best hands and our very worst hands. Now, this doesn't mean we're going to be three betting absolute garbage. When I say worst hands, it just means the worst hands that we would continue in that specific configuration. Let me give a couple examples. So let's say a pro opens from under the gun and we are also early position. Our three bets for value may just be very, very top of range here. We just want to three bet the hands that can absolutely cooler their opening range. So it may look something like this, pocket aces, pocket kings, ace king suited. Now, we don't have many raises for value here. So we also don't need a ton of raises as bluffs here. We may just want to three bet as our bluffs the bottom of our continuing range, which may be like our worst suited ace x, something like ace five suited, and then maybe our worst suited broadways that would continue here. King jack suited, queen jack suited, jack 10 suited. And then everything in the middle would be called ace king off, ace queen suited, ace jack suited, ace 10 suited. All of these hands would just be calls here. So our range versus an early position pro open may look something like this. Now let me give an example of how this shifts as we get to later positions. So let's say a pro opens from the cutoff and we are on the button now. So now we're going to certainly be raising wider for value. Our value range may look something like this, where we go all the way down to pocket jacks, ace king suited, ace king off here, maybe ace queen suited. And now the three bet bluffs would come from the bottom of our continue range. So maybe our worst suited king that would continue like king nine suited, and maybe our worst suited aces that would continue something like ace deuce suited and ace six suited. And as you can see now, this ace five suited that was three betting before is now more of the middle of our range. We want to be calling with the middle of our range, remember, to let the fish into the pot. And as you can see, the middle of our range shifts as we get to later positions. Now, all these pocket pairs can call. And obviously, we can call much wider when the cutoff opens than when an under-the-gun player opens. And then maybe these 9x hands would be worked in as 3-bets as well. So again, the green hands are calling, the red hands are 3-betting, and this is what a polar 3-bet range looks like when a pro opens cutoff and we are on the button. So now we've got preflop out of the way. Let's jump into the shrimp and potatoes. Here are the four guiding heuristics I use when playing against pros. Number one, and this is most important. What would I do versus this line? It sounds so simple. It sounds so stupid, but just simply put yourself into their shoes and whatever line, whatever action you're about to take, just ask, what would you do if this line was taken against you? If you're about to check raise on the river, put yourself in their shoes and think, okay, if I was facing the check raise as them, what would I do? And this can guide you to the most profitable action quite simply time and time again. Number two, delayed gratification when bluffing. You don't always have to bluff right now if just simply being a little bit more patient or waiting a little bit longer will actually increase your fold equity. Number three, play your bluffs like they play value. When you're playing against live pros, you'll start to notice there are lines that are massively overbluffed and there are lines that are massively, massively underbluffed. And as you start to gain more experience playing, you'll start to notice these patterns over and over again. So essentially what you want to do, the lines that are overbluffed, that's where you want to put a lot of your value you and the lines that are under bluffed, well, that's where you want to put a lot of your bluffs. And finally, number four, which is the inverse to the last one, it's simply play your value like they play bluffs. All right, I know it's a lot of words. It's a lot of talking. Let's jump into examples. Let me show you. And hopefully these four guiding heuristics will start to click. All right, so into the examples. First off, we're going to start off with what would I do versus this line? So we're playing five, 10, 20. You'll notice hold a manager three says it's a 10 and then a $10 ante. It's just incapable of doing three blinds. So ignore that. This is five, 10, 20. The villain in the hand is going to be the pro here under the gun who is going to open to $60. Fish calls on the button, fish calls in the small blind, and we are in the third blind with a suited king. We are going to come along as well from the 20. Flop comes ace king three, so we flop bottom two. Pretty good for us. We're going to check it over and flow to the pro. Pro is going to bet $110 here. Fish on the button folds, fish in the small blind folds, and now back to us. First, let's think about what the pro's range is for C betting on this flop. It's probably going to be pretty strong, right? Because he bet four ways. He bet into three other people, including two fish. So he's probably got to realize here, he just doesn't have much fold equity. So what's he going to have? Well, for value, at worst, he's probably going to have a pretty strong ace. Ace 10, ace jack, ace queen, something like that. He could certainly have two pair of sets as well. And then as his semi bluffs here, he's probably just going to be drawing from hands that have a ton of equity, right? Maybe like combo draws, jack 10 of spades, queen jack of spades. Remember, he opened under the gun, so he just probably doesn't have many weak suited connectors. So he either has a flush draw, a strong ace, or a hand that we lose to. Now that we've come up with this range, let's think about what would I 
slide do versus a slide. So let's put ourselves in his shoes now. And if we were in his shoes and we see bet on this flop four ways, how would we respond to a check raise from another pro in the third blind? Well, if we had a hand like ace jack, ace 10, ace queen here, yeah, we may call on the flop. But personally, if I got check raised with a hand like ace queen here in his shoes, I would already be feeling a little bit squeamish. Let's say we called with ace queen, the turn's a blank, and the pro in the third blind, which is us here, bombs again here on the turn, and we have ace queen, ace jack, I would just be folding because this is a spot that's massively under bluffed. So check raising then with a hand like king three just doesn't seem all that good if the pro is going to be doing folding on the turn with hands like ace queen or ace jack or ace 10 at a pretty high frequency. So now let's think, what would I do versus this line if I got called? Well, if we're the pro here under the gun and we have a hand like ace queen, ace jack, whatever, what are we going to do on the turn? We're going to keep betting for value, trying to get called by a weaker ace, trying to get called by draws. And then if we get called on the turn and the river's a blank, well, with ace queen or ace jack, we're probably going to bet again. So in this situation, the pro, he's going to probably bet thinly for three streets if the board runs out blank. And also, if he has a bluff, he's probably going to continue bluffing at least across most turns. So again, what would I do versus this line? If we're the pro, if we get check raised here with a hand like ace queen or ace jack, we're probably calling once and folding the turn. If we get called here when we see bet the flop as the pro, we are probably going to continue barreling for value and we're going to continue bluffing. So with a hand like king three here on this flop, if we just simply ask, what would I do versus this line? It makes sense here in this specific spot to continue quite often as a call. All right, guys, real quick, if you're enjoying the video, please, please, please hit that subscribe button. If you see me in person, just come up to me and say, hey, I subscribe to Hungry Horse Poker. And you know what I will do for you? I will pull out my phone and show you a picture of a giant tortoise. All right, step number two here, delayed gratification when bluffing. And this is a 10, 20, 40 game. Again, hold a manager three, just can't display three blinds. Why? I, I don't really know. No one really knows. So a pro opens from under the gun to 110. We are in the 40 with jack nine suited and we are going to call. We go to a flop 10, five, four, three clubs. We are just pretty much done with this hand, right? If he see bets on this flop, we are just folding. We have nothing going on. So we check and that is not what happens, right? Or else we wouldn't really have an example here. So he checks it back. We go to a turn and now the turn is a five. So we have complete air here. And I think most players intuition in this spot with Jack High would be to think, okay, maybe we should start a bluff here. But in my opinion, that is not the best play. And I wanna show why delayed gratification is so good. What is his range when he checks back this flop? He could just have some showdown value, ace queen, ace king. He could have some pocket pairs, maybe like pocket eights, pocket nines. He could maybe just have an over pair that doesn't have a club, red pocket queens or pocket kings, right? He's going to have quite a lot of showdown value here. You would think a lot of the time if he had air, he's probably just going to bet himself. And if he had a strong value hand on this flop, being in position relatively deep, he's probably going to bet himself. If he does have a hand like red pocket kings and we come out and just bet this turn where well, he's going to call and now the river is not a club and we bet again, he's probably going to call. So we're just going to get called quite a bit by the top of his range. And if he does have a hand like ace king, he may call the turn one one time if he has like the king of clubs in his hand or whatever and he'll probably fold the river but the problem is we're just going to get called here quite a lot when he does show up with jacks queens kings aces so by just going bet bet sure we get some folds but we don't get all the folds. Now let's think what happens if we check. He's going to start betting. If he did have a hand like red jacks here, or red queens, at this point, he certainly got the green light to start betting for value. He's probably not going to check back again. And because most people in position are not going to check back nutted hands like an ace high flush here or a set here, when he bets, now we kind of just have carte blanche to just check raise and blow him off of whatever he has. We can check raise huge. He'll call with pocket jacks, pocket queens, and now we can just bomb the river. What does it look like we have, right? It looks like we just have a monster, either a full house or an ace high flush, right? And if he does have a hand like ace high, he may check back again, but we can blow that hand off on the river. When the river comes a blank, now we can just bet big, get the ace highs to fold. By employing this strategy of delayed gratification, we essentially just get to win this pot near 100% of the time. We go for the check here, he checks back. Now the river is an ace. So what does he have when he checks back? 
back twice. He probably now has a hand like ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack. He checked back twice, right? If he did have a hand like an overpair, he's probably gonna bet on the turn. If we come out and bet here, what's he gonna do with a strong hand like ace-king or ace-queen? He's going to call. But if we check here, what's he gonna do with those hands? He's going to bet. And now that opens up the door for us to maximize fold equity. Betting yourself minimizes fold equity. Going for the check raise maximizes fold equity. Pros, bet thinly for value. That's something they do much differently than fish. They're going to bet thinly for value. So if we check here and he does have ace, king, ace, queen, he's going to bet. But also, let's say he just had some type of whiff. Let's say he had some type of give up. Maybe he had like king, queen of hearts that decided just not to bluff on the flop or turn. Well, if we check here, that hand is also going to bet. Whereas if we just bet, that hand would fold. And if we check, king, queen of hearts here is going to stab. And now we just get the stab from king, queen of hearts. We get the value bet from ace, king, ace, queen. And we get to check raise and we get to fold all of that. So we check once again for the third time. He bets $80. We check raise for the big boy size, just disrespectfully to $540. He shakes his head, mutters a few words under his breath, and he folds. And uh, we just smile and say, oops, I guess we got a little bit too greedy and rake in the pot. All right, next hand here. And this is one of my favorites because it illustrates a couple of concepts, but most importantly, it illustrates the play your bluffs like they would play value. So we're playing 10, 20, 40. Again, this third blind is the 40 here. A pro opens from the hijack here. We're in the cutoff with eight, seven of diamonds. This is going to be one of our polar three bets as we talked about. So we have some three bets, the top of our range for value. And then the bottom of our continuing range is going to be our three bet bluffs. This works nicely as a three bet bluff. So we go for the three bet to 350. I'm going to fold back around to the pro who's going to make it a thousand dollars. He four bets. And this hand actually functions pretty nicely as a continue. Our straight outs are clean. Our two pair outs are clean, et cetera. We call and we are playing a four bet pot in position, a six, four. And we do flop a gutter here and he comes out and bets 400 into 2000. So a very small bet, just about 20% pot. So in position with the gut shot and the backdoor flush draw, we have enough equity to continue here. No real reason to raise on this board. Raising just doesn't accomplish anything. Of course, he can still have aces, ace king, etc. So we are going to call. Now we're going to go to a turn and look at that sweet baby there. Look at that sweet baby there. Now we are open-ended. So we pick up some additional equity and now surprisingly he checks to us. And this is where the crux of this heuristic comes into play. Remember, play your bluffs like they would play value. First, let's walk through what happens if. So if he does have a hand like pocket aces or ace king, and we bet on this turn, what's going to happen? Well, he's going to call, and then we're going to go to the river. We're going to get to the river a lot of times with eight high. If we brick our straight draw, he's going to check again. We're going to end up bluffing into a range that's just going to snap us off. If he does have a hand like kings or queens, and he checks to us on the turn, and we bet, that hand's going to fold, which is great. So if we do bluff this turn, I guess we get kings and queens to fold. Of course, we get called by ace, king, aces, whatever. But I think we can be a little bit more efficient because think what happens if, if we check back this turn, say the river's a blank, say the river's an offsuit deuce, what's he going to do with kings and queens? Well, he's going to check again. Now at this point, we kind of have the green light and we can just bet, get the kings and queens to fold at near 100% frequency. And we think what happens also on that river blank, a river deuce, is if he does have aces, ace, king, ace, queen suited hands like that, what's he going to do? Well, after we check back the turn, he's probably going to come out and now bet the river for value. And if he bets the river, well, and we don't get there, we can just fold. So what happens here if we check back this turn? We lose zero future streets if he does have top of range like aces or ace king. And we also just get kings and queens to fold on the river. No matter what, we just get that information on the river. So you're probably wondering, how does this heuristic come into play? How does play your bluffs like they play value come into play? Well, think about this situation. If we did get to this spot with a hand like ace queen or ace jack suited, what would we do on this turn in a four bet pot? It's kind of like a way ahead, way behind spot. We would probably check back this turn, right? With our value hands, a lot of them, we would check back this turn. So when we check back this turn and he checks to us on the river, you're probably wondering why is he going to fold kings and queens on the river to just one bet from us? What does it look like we have when we check back this turn? If we had a bluff in most cases, most players with eight high here would get impatient and start bluffing on this turn. So when we check back the turn, it looks like we have showdown value. So now if he checks the river, when he has pocket kings or pocket queens, it looks like we have an ace that checked back the turn. Now when he checks the river to us and we bet, it just looks like we're betting for value. So play your bluffs like they would play value. How would most pros play value here with an ace? They would check back. 
unless they had ace king plus even sometimes with ace king most pros with an ace on this turn would check back so we actually check back this turn with eight high now the river is a queen so a lot of good things happen here now if he comes out and bets this river obviously we just snap fold he can have aces he can have ace king still he could even have a hand like pocket queens right so if he comes out and bets this river we just have an easy snap fold we lost four hundred dollars post flop who cares but if he checks this river most of his range now looks like pocket kings might he check this river sometimes with ace king because the river's a queen he gets a little squeamish sure he could have some ace king so i just asked simply on this river what size do i need to bet to get pocket kings to fold it doesn't need to be that big so i actually go 1200 here i think you probably go a little smaller maybe even a thousand here and he tanks and tanks and tanks finally someone calls the clock he shows an ace he says you have no bluffs in this spot i can't find any bluffs and then he folded he later told me he had ace do suited so he was just four betting as a bluff here play your bluffs like they play value. All right, last one here. And this is play your value like they play bluffs. So this is the inverse of number three. So this hand is one of our horses, one of the players we coach for profit. And he is playing five, five, 10. And he has pocket jacks here in the third blind. So a pro opens on the button to 35. He is in the third blind here. He is going to three bet slam dunk three bet versus a button open to 165. Pro on the button is going to call. Flop here comes eight, six, four with a bunch of hearts. And as is our MO in this spot, we're just going to be doing a lot of checking from out of position as the preflop raiser. If you'd like to know why we're doing so much checking, check out our ultimate guide to playing out of position. Our student in this hand, he goes for the check. The pro bets 135, small bet here on this flop. And the hero in this hand, he elects to call. Everything looks pretty good so far. We go to a turn, which is an innocuous deuce of diamonds. We check it over. Pro on the button checks. Now we go to a river, which is another deuce. So now let's think in this spot. Remember the guiding heuristic here, play your value like they play bluff. So first let's think what is their range and what happens if? So he opened the button and called a three bet, C bet the flop and check back the turn. So what is his range? Well, his range could be some showdown value here. 8x, maybe ace 8, 8, 9, 10, 8 suited, 8, 7 suited. So he could have some showdown value, maybe some pocket nines, pocket tens makes some sense, right? Or he could have some air, maybe some hands like king, queen of diamonds that just stabbed the flop, got called, got a little bit squeamish and didn't want to run a three street bluff with no equity. He probably doesn't have very many strong hands here, right? He doesn't have flushes. He just keep betting on the turn. He doesn't have sets. He would just keep betting on the turn. Most of his range here looks like showdown value or air. So what happens if? Well, if we bet here, you know, some good things can happen. We just get snapped off by a lot of the showdown value. If he has nines, tens, eight X, even sevens, he's probably going to call if we bet here and don't use some absurd size, we're going to get called. But if he has air and we bet those hands just fold. So now let's think what happens if we check. Well, if we check here, what does our hand look like? We three bet, we check called the flop, we check the turn, and now we check the river. What hand are they going to put us on? Probably a hand like ace king or ace queen with a heart. So if we check this river and he does have thin value hand and like pocket nines, ace eight suited, what are those hands going to do? Well, they're going to bet at a high frequency. Again, one of the things we talked about with pros is they're going to value bet thinly. What about if he has air? If he did give up on the turn with a hand like king, queen of diamonds, what's he going to do if we check again? Well, he's going to bluff. He's going to bluff at a high frequency. It just looks like we have ace king or ace queen all the time here. It looks like he's going to be able to get a fold. So if he has thin value, he's going to bet. And if he has air, he's going to bet. So what should we do? We should check and we check. And now let's say he bets 300. Well, what should we do? We have a slam dunk call, right? We beat all of his value. We beat his bluffs. So we should be calling here, right? Well, let's consider all of our options. What happens if we raise? Hmm. Let's go back to heuristic number one now. What would I do versus this line? So put yourself in his shoes. You have a hand like pocket nine here. The river's a blank. Now they check again. You bet for value with pocket nines. And now they check raise. Doesn't make any sense because you think, what well, the guy in the third blind here, if he had a flush, he'd probably just bet the flop himself or he would check raise the flop. Or if the turn went check, check, he'd just come out and bet the river. Or if he had an overpair, he would bet the flop himself sometimes, or he would check raise the flop, or he would just come out and bet the river. So what does it look like when they check call the flop, turn goes check, check, and now they check the river and now they check raise the river. It looks like the third blind here has a hand like ace queen or ace king with a heart that now decides that they don't have showdown value and it's turning into a bluff. So what should we do with pocket jacks here? Well, we're essentially free rolling. We should check raise here because we look full of shit. Play your value like they play bluffs. So let's check raise here. Let's check raise and put all the money in. Look at that check raise size. We check raise to 1700. Now we have negative $5 left. I'm not sure that's allowed in poker, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe this is some, maybe this is a different variation. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this four-step guide on how to crush poker pros and it helps you level up your win rate. Thank you guys and have a gentle day.